Welcome to the Free Range American Podcast with uh, Trevor Thompson, Logan Stark, Whole Creamer. Is that how you pronounce that? Whole Creamer? Whole Creamer. And myself, Whole milk. we were just going over and uh, pontificating about bare feet and uh, how somebody had made a comment on a, on a previous <laughs> podcast about how fucking disgusting it was to see people's bare feet. So Logan so and I are flanking in once again, yeah. bare feet. <laughs> may we preface this. We don't give a fuck <laughs> if you don't like our bare feet. Uh, go listen or tune into somebody else's podcast. We're anti Or just don't prisons. watch. Go, don't watch. Yeah, listen. Just don't watch. Listen. I don't know. Uh, because, you know, we do these things for the people that find value out of them. Also, what kind of hang- so turned off by a fucking bare foot. What kind of hang-ups like, do you have come to have? Come on, man. Yeah, like, dude, feet. maybe. <laughs> My feet are <laughs> yeah. free. Maybe and they're like, ranging. Take up a hobby like stamp collecting or something. Fucking chill out with that stuff. Or coins I don't know. or marbles. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you like collect vintage board games. Anything but make a comment <laughs> in the YouTube ah. in the YouTubes about bare feet. <laughs> Fuck. That was the only thing too. It was like, love your got love what you love guys it. are doing. Love the new podcast. Those are my favorite one below. Bad comments. <laughs> you guys are degenerates with your bare feet, and I don't want to see that. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> it's weird, like our, man. Our dick and like balls it's are weird hanging out. That you made the comment about bare feet. You took a notice. Yeah. So speaking of bare feet, uh, you're. You have guided it, people to see bare feet. Yes. Is that right? That's is, that, what I, is that what you do? Yes. What we do done? The technical term? Bare viewing for at bare feet. How does that work? Because it just seems like a lot of people are up in Alaska. It yes. seems like you would go to a higher density population to look at bare feet. You know, it, it's just one of those things. You know, they've been known to have some of the largest feet in the world right. there. So that's just what people like to Got show it. up to see. Um, yeah. It's a... Yeah, it's no mystery why they want to be there. Is there a technical term for that? No, just bare feet. Yeah. Just bare feet viewing just bare. and such. <laughs> so we don't actually get to see bears. We just kind of look at their footprints in the mud. Mm, I like that. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's really nice. Get real close. Yeah, we don't actually want to show people bears. They have to come back on a hunt for one of those. Ooh. So what what do you tell what do you tell people you are when when you're introducing yourself to new people. So if you're to introduce yourself to the Free Range American audience, well number one my name is Cole C- Kramer. Oh, interesting. Not so Cole. I've been saying it wrong You've all this time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. For well, my mom that's watching. Minor yeah. error. Is your mom going to watch this? Well, she may. Yeah, okay. Not anymore. Your mom obviously. called you on the Don't range earlier to today, she didn't did. she? Yeah. yeah. Love you, mom. <laughs> we were, we Which were all I loved, pretty certain. I loved your response cuz it was just so honest like, "Hey mom, Shooting arrows with my friends. What's up? Shooting bows and arrows with my friends. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in the basement like, playing video games. So great you have friends, Cole. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Mom. You Was she surprised job. that you have friends? When you yeah. say, I'm with my friends, yeah. is she yeah. surprised that you have friends? Yeah, she worries about me like kind of being in the woods too much. Right. Like, Are you still in your, your tent? <laughs> <laughs> I have a house now. <laughs> oh, it's so wonderful. It has rooms and a floor. Yeah. So... No, you know, I've always been a social person Yeah. ever since a child. I right. was always pretty social, so, right. she, you know. It, but I think she's happy that I have multiple friends and not just one. Yeah. And they're live, too. They're not just, like, stuffed, stuffed dolls or something off in the corner. <laughs> so, but, uh, no, so I am a hunting guide. You're a like hunting to guide. To people, you okay. know. A hunting guide, mm. an outfitter. I know of this most but I'm trying to pull this out of you. Yes. This is called a show format oh, I where see. I start to talk about things and I just naturally come into conversation. I worry about what's going to come out of your mouth. But, uh, <laughs> and that's why I yeah. need to just cut it off with this. And But you go ahead. So we've known each other for what, a year? We met last here, year, TAC. Yeah, yeah, here, I think. Yeah, we met here or in Park City. So we're at the Total Archery Challenge here in Big Sky. This is our second year shooting with whole... Sorry going to take me a minute to adjust because I just learned your your name. <laughs> Whole Kramer. Whole Kramer. Whole Kramer. Kramer. How do you say it again? Kramer. No, it, it was perfect. Kramer. The way you said it. Man Kramer. Is that? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> oh, uh, Cole Kramer. And you're a guide 
in Alaska. Kodiak, Alaska. Which is uh, fairly well known for what type of animal? For brown bears. Mm, brown bear, not Kodiak bears. Kodiak, brown bears. Got it. Kodiak, brown bears. So here's a question, which I think a lot of people need to know the answer to straight away. What is the difference between a Kodiak, brown bear, and a grizzly bear? Well, the grizzly bear, no, number one, brown bears are, co- are uh, Ursus arctos mendedorfi or mendedorfi. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that. Grizzly bears are Ursus arctos horribilis. So different scientific name. Are you making shit up right now or are you telling the it's truth? Facts. It's a fact. Got it. Jamie, pull that up. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait. Balls. <laughs> <laughs> um, balls. balls. Make it so. He doesn't even know how to uh, use a computer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so they're. You know, brown bears are living on the coast, okay? Okay. And they have a different diet. You know, they're going to be more so predominantly fish, uh, but they do eat a lot of grass and roots and all sorts of other stuff, but lots of fish, high protein Two diet. very distinctly different animals between a Kodiak brown bear and a grizzly bear. Yeah, I mean, you're, I mean, obviously, yes, one is quite a bit larger, like potentially like pushing a thousand pounds heavier. You know, or or a thousand pounds more in weight, seven hundred to a thousand pounds, depending on. Yeah. So a Kodiak brown bear. Yeah, they can get you know, fourteen to sixteen hundred pounds. Yeah, because a grizz can get like they can be the same I mean, size as a large like, black bear, like a giant black bear, uh, and a, a grizz. Lot. Well, they're, yeah. they're 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 quite bigger, but I mean, yeah, I guess you can get have a black bear that's yeah. about eight feet. Yeah. But that's a very very large black bear. Black bear. Grizzlies, I mean, I've taken some grizzlies that are like in that eight and a half to nine foot range. Right. You know, but here's the thing. They don't know where that line is, right? But a grizzly bear, you know, they just have a lot different diet. You know, they're scrounging around looking for something to eat. They're eating, right. you know, whatever they can get their hands on. You know, brown bears, they're pretty full with their eating their, you know, all the fish that come up and, you know, all the coastal grass. Uh, they just have a much higher, richer protein diet, you know, compared Got to it. a grizzly bear. And grizzly bears are just pissed off and hungry all the time, man. <clears throat> But, you know, they don't know where that imaginary line is. In Alaska, though, basically above, I uh, I could be wrong, it's like the 60th parallel or something of that nature, I believe. Above that is a grizzly bear. Get closer there. Yeah. There you go. Above that is a grizzly bear and below it's a brown bear. Seriously? Yes. So it's what not like... What if a bear like, walks not, from no, no. Yeah. one side it's, to the other? Then it's... it's Technically, it's they just call it... Seriously? Know, one or the other. Yeah. Interesting. But, yeah, so, I mean, it's not... It's not like, okay, this one's a grizzly bear, this one's a brown bear standing next to each other. You can just totally tell. Because they look damn similar. They, they can look pretty similar, yes. Yeah. But it's just more so that, that high-protein diet just, you know, pushes them above and beyond. Because there is, like, grizzly bears that live on the western Alaskan coast. That right. You would think they're a brown bear, and they're eating fish, too. Right. Gotcha. And are you guiding for both? Um, I typically just guide for brown bear, but I have guided for a lot of grizzlies in the past okay. yeah but on kodiak and on the alaska peninsula we're all focused for just the brown bears so coastal brown bears why like why just because of the size it's a better trophy. yeah that's just i mean you, w- number one we're limited to guide areas got it in the state we can only guide in three areas of the state so you have to pick and choose okay and and yeah our specialty has just been brown bears though for the most part um for how long? How long have you been guiding? Well, since 2002, when I moved up to Alaska. So, um, And what yeah. spurred that move? Uh, my uncle was in the Coast Guard. First time I came up, I was like 11 years old to Alaska and just totally fell in love with the place. It was just badass. You know, I lived in Kansas at the time, and it was like... Minor difference? Yeah. You know, it's flat. I'd never seen the mountains before. And it's like, go up to Alaska, and it's the ocean, mountains... You know, fish, it's just unbelievable. Right. And so ever since then, I knew that, okay, I'm moving to Alaska. Like, I have to go to Alaska. Then, shortly after, I got into hunting, and then I thought, oh, wow, I could maybe become a hunting guide, you know? And so that's kind of, um, <laughs> um, that's how, that's what spurred that. And I moved, I went up there, like, when I was uh, 17. So right before I graduated, I went up on a deer hunt, and I started talking to outfitters, and seeing if they, you know, would be interested in, in hiring me as a guide or a packer. Right. Know, uh, after high school, and they're all just like, get out of school, then come talk to us, whatever, kid. 
And like, I would call people from, I was in high school my junior year and was calling guys um, from Sports of Field magazine. My English teacher let me go into her office and use her phone when I was like done with my homework. And she would allow me to go use her phone and I called outfitters <laughs> from school. Really? Yeah. And they're like, well, how old are you? You know, these guys that I was yeah. talking to. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm, you know, 16th time. Well, aren't you in school? I'm like, yeah, I'm in school. They're like, why aren't you in school now? I'm like, no, no, I'm in school. Like, I'm <laughs> in school now. I'm calling from school. But uh, anyways, that's just something I always, I, I always enjoyed being around people. Like, I didn't have to be one pulling the trigger all the time. Right. It's kind of like you find out pretty quickly when you're a hunter. Like, if you get stoked to see your friends take animals too. Right. And you're just helping out. So that was always pretty awesome, you know, to be a part of. And that's kind of what drove me to want to pursue that guiding uh career i guess it's kind of more so like let's just see how this goes for a couple years and right work it out of my system but, and or not kind of, yeah or not just kind of kept opening doors and moving forward you know what they have you doing those first couple years just i mean you're it's an apprenticeship you right know? you're just going along and and helping out and whatever you know some outfitters like i just said yes to everyone everyone who would I, number one i had some very good mentors and they like I was hired on by one outfitter and he'd say, I, I can only use you for X amount of time. Oh, by the way, why don't you go help out this guy? Mm -hmm. You know, then maybe go help this guy out. And so I would just jump from camp to camp, whether it be just packing gear for guys. Um, but during that time, you know, they're, they're just teaching you the ropes, right? Like they're showing you how to glass, showing you the, you know, how to set up camps appropriately, um, trophy judging of animals, you know, uh, sexing, you know, bears. Okay. Is this a male or female, you know, uh, just learning all the ins and outs, you know, right. and, and just dealing with people, you know, it's like, uh, there's guys who are awesome hunters, but they're not a, not a good guide at all. You know, they're right. not worth a damn out there because they can't deal with people. You know, I mean, you guided, uh, river trips, right? Yeah. Rafting trips. And it's like, if you don't enjoy other people being around, if you don't enjoy like teaching things of, to people, then you're not going to, you're not going to be very fun to be around, you know? Yeah. And you have to find commonality with people. Yeah. Uh, and even if you despise them, yeah, you have to be super, super nice. And that's a, you know, professional, courteous, nice. So, you, you know, I mean, I think that's one of the things that I think people don't quite understand or think about when it comes to guiding is like, you really do have to kind of suck it up yeah, and, you know, dealing with bad clients at times, like, I mean, I've told guys on river trips like hey why don't i just we're gonna be close to an airstrip 15 miles from here so why don't i just fire up the sat phone and get you on the plane because mm -hmm. you're a dick yeah you're not you're yeah. not working out here yeah yeah i've had to correct a few clients that were getting a little out of hand in the past and it's kind of like hey dude w we don't need to be here if this is the way it's gonna be right kind of you know but on the other hand though like i tell all of our young guides or whatever you know, each one of these people coming on these trips, this is, you could have 10 trips in a row, right? But every single person coming, that's like potentially the trip of their lifetime, yeah. right? So you have to put on that happy face and answer these questions every time. And, it's, and, it, and it could be so monotonous sort of same questions and, and walking by these types of things all the time. But these people, they don't know what this stuff is, that type right. of animal or whatever. So you have to explain it and, and remember that these people are there or potentially like the trip of their life, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe so, the only time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and you know, um, it, it's just one of those things I learned early on. It doesn't do any good to, you know, disagree too much with the people and start talking shit, and <laughs> it can go south pretty quick, you know. But like as a young guy, that it's it, it's hard because when I was starting, like when I was like nineteen and twenty, uh, taking guys out. It, it was difficult. I had the best line I had from a guy. He's like, he's like, son, I don't know how you get off telling me what to do out here. I've been hunting longer than you've been around, and I've got underwear older than you. Right. I was like, oh, wow. Maybe you should change your underwear. Like, come on, man. <laughs> <That's> you <know? laughs> but, like, but it's like, yeah, no, it's true. There's guys that definitely have been hunting a lot longer than me, but I think I maybe know this area and right. this type of animal maybe just a little better. Right. You know, so now, maybe you're hiring me to do it. Why don't you just follow my lead? Why don't you just let me do it? Yeah. 
there's a fair amount of risk associated with what you do. You know, you're hunting fairly dangerous animal. And on top of the climate. Which and, one? And what are you talking terrain. about? The, the black tail. Like the black tail? Yeah. Yeah, the black They're tail. They're scary. The black tail. Or the other things. The other things. The goats. Got it. Goats. The other four legged. Is that? Yeah. The goats. With the, with the, the bare hands. The bare oh, hands. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 bear, the bear hands. The berries. I, I was watching one of your videos on Instagram the other day, and you, you're tracking this bear move across the mountains for a while. And it, it finally gets in, you know, a pretty close distance. It, it kind of. First looks like he pops up at about 25 yards or so, and and you you start chirping at him. You're like, shoot, 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 shoot now, shoot, shoot him. And I was curious, like, do you guys have any sort of prerequisites for people that are coming up to hunt brown bear? Uh, or do you, you just, like- yeah, like, do you have any vetting process <laughs> for anybody, or you pretty much take uh, all you- comers? You, I mean, you, when people call, like, I definitely get a feel for them. You know, you're kind of interviewing them on the phone, right? I'm not just going to take anyone. But it's also part of my job to get them prepared. You know, I've had lots of guys come up that have only whitetail hunted, you know, but, but that's part just of the Just whitetail? Process. Yeah. I've only whitetail hunted. I mean, bear are, like, a very iconic animal. Yeah. You know, and so there's been guys that just, man, I've always, you know, I mean, we all, as soon as you have a, a stuffed animal as a child, it's most likely a teddy bear right and so people are just used to seeing bears and watching them and i mean like when guys come on hunts with us i mean it's like a big bear viewing trip you're watching lots of bears so really? it's pretty cool lots yeah. of bear feet yeah but uh you know i mean i try to get a feel for them and and like what more so when i take a lot of archery hunters it's like i've told guys like hey man you know they'll say i'm gonna bring a bow but i'll probably bring a rifle too you know and this and that and the other and it's like you know, if you're not 100% sold on the bow, you probably just better bring the rifle because, number one, a lot of guys will talk themselves out of using a bow very quick, you know, or they find out that bears really make them nervous. A lot of guys talk a big talk. Uh, yeah. And then yeah. when they start getting around bears or I show them a smaller bear up close and we get in on them and they're like, oh, shit, man, this is a little more intimidating than I thought. For sure. Um, but I've also had guys, I had a guy with a recurve once, the bear hung up at 70 yards, and he goes, give me the gun. I hand him the gun, and, and he's getting ready to shoot, and the bear went back to fishing. And I'm like, no, give me give me that gun, and I'll give you the recurve back. And we went down and um, ended up shooting him. But, like, he was totally set on shooting him with his gun, but I could tell we could get in close on him now since he was back yeah. to fishing. So I handed him that bow back, and he was pretty stoked with it once. We what, is your, it, what is your uh, bear hunting weapon of choice? Uh, 375 H&H is yeah. a pretty – I mean, it's – pretty potent medicine form i mean they That's just big gun. it makes them think twice when it's when it hits that bear it stops them in their tracks sometime it'll knock them off their feet but like it just makes them rethink life like it totally <laughs> like weird jolts them and you can just see that bullet impact and it just stops them whereas like smaller calibers it's just a sting and they're looking around but like when that 375 hits them it it makes them think about life right there you know it uh, stops them in their tracks most of the time but they, I've definitely had them be shot seven or eight times with a 375. They don't really, play. yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't want no, to die. I, I use a 458 lot quite often, especially with bow hunters, and and that's shooting up to a 500 grain bullet. But uh, the 375 Ooh. is is a good caliber because it's using up a, a lot of the energy inside of the bear, and the the bullet is hanging up just on inside the skin. You know, if you had like uh, like a seven mm or something speedy. Yeah, it, well, that, and then they'll bullet a lot of times blow up inside of them and fragment up. But um, if you had it on like slow mo, you know, you you would probably watch that skin expand out on that brown bear on the opposite side. Just um, a little ripple effect. Yeah, going down. Really? yeah. the bullet's always sitting there on the hide on that far side. Wow, it rarely punches through unless you're shooting like a solid. You know, if you're shooting like a barn saw right. or something of that nature, then they'll poke through. But a lot of times, um, it's just always in the skin. Broadside or, I mean, like a lot of times I've shot them chest going to rear. Or it's my job, like if they're wounded and getting away, I've had to shoot them in the rear. Mm-hmm. But I'll find it in the chest, huh. you know. Um, I had a hunter <laughs> a couple springs back shoot a bear at 100 yards, hit him in the chest of what I thought. He rolled, went into the brush. He was with a sow. And the sow sat there and stared into the brush 
and we couldn't see the bear anymore. And I said, just be ready for another shot if he comes out. But we couldn't, he never moved. We couldn't see anything. 10 minutes later, he comes walking back out. And they're like, there he is. And I said, hang on, hang on. I want to make sure it's the same bear. I'm like, because if you hit that bear in the chest, like, he should be dead. Right, yeah. This could be another boar that was ghosting back in the brush that was coming in because she's a hot yeah. sow. I said, just hang on. Finally, I identified that it was him. But right before that, he walks over, mounts the sow again, walking totally normal. <laughs> mounts the sow. He come, they, they get in the opening. I said, okay, that's him. Go ahead, take him. Boom, shoot him. I'm like, man, maybe he didn't hit him on that first shot. It's weird. Go up there, first shot, shot him in the chest, and the bullet was in his butt. So he would have what eventually died. But he didn't hit the lung, though. But wow. the, the bear Man, is they're hard, they are hard creatures. Well, it's yeah, interesting, but that's you know. That's you want to go out, though, right? If you fuck yeah, get yeah, you shot get shot. Yeah. You're like, I'm gonna, I'm right, gonna go mount something. One more in me. Oh, one more. Man. I got it, honey. Yeah, but one I mean, less chance to reproduce. Let's go. But that, that's my point. Like, there's some guys that just want to use smaller calibers. Can it get the job done? Yes, I've had guys use seven millimeters, but uh, a lot of guys. Uh, I've had a lot of um, bears shot with a 300 Win Mag. You know, it can do the job, but a 375 just does a much better job. <laughs> what do you think about a 338 Lapua mag? I you think that would they, do they it? They do a good job. Yeah, I had a guy bring one one time, and we had a charging bear, and he shot him at 20 yards, and it and he shot him in the chest, and it pushed him back on his haunches, and he he was rethinking. Oh, he was, well. he, okay, okay. And, uh, okay. but it, it, it it's a, you know. That's it's a, a big bullet. It is. Yeah. It's a fast bullet. You know, on dangerous game, we don't typically like a lot of fast Right. That, that four five eight is huge. And, and explain why. Well, I'm not a gun nut. Okay, I, I can't explain all these things, but I think, um, yeah, I'm not a gun nut, and I don't even want to try to. But what happens too to the much, bear? But I, I think we want that slower burn, like just heavy punch. Right. We want that that heavy punch hitting that bear. You know, we want them feeling all the all the energy. Right. You know, not just zipping through them. Yep. You know, when when um, there was another story. One of uh, my guide friends had a guy bring a 50 cal. Right. And the guy ended up shooting the bear at about 100 yards, apparently. Right. And, um, and this guy, I trust him. And he's not telling a story. The guy hit him five times with the 50 Whoa. cal. One of the shots hit him in the <laughs> neck, and the bullet wrapped around and was just sitting in the skin on, on, the, um, on the skull. But it didn't, it, it just kind of wrapped around. So my point is, people think, oh, wow, you're just going to blow apart. It doesn't happen. You know, they're, they're right. very tough, uh, real kind of elastic skin, Yeah. you know, and uh, the heavy bone and muscle, you know, lots of fat that clog up the holes. Right. So you're yeah, like, gonna, how, how, they do how look thick like is their hide? Their hide's not that thick, honestly. It, it's more so the fat and, mu and muscle and bone. That's, that's the tough issue. The hide's not that thick on bears. Like Cape buffalo hides or water buffalo. You know, I've got a water buffalo down in Australia, and, and those hides are so thick. Yeah, moose hides. I mean, moose. Thick. I was just about yeah, to say, we, really like, when we skinned out those moose, like the yeah. haunches and the shoulders yeah. on those things, that's bear, like a quarter inch thick. Yeah, bear yeah. necks are really thick. Yeah. Because they, they fight a lot. They're all scarred up. Right. A lot. And, you know, those are thick. But, you know, um, the initial, like, most for the hide is, is pretty thin. Realistically. Yeah. How close... When, I mean, you've obviously, uh, how many bear hunts have you guided, do you think? I, yeah, I don't know. Into the hundreds. Hundreds. Well, no, no, I, sorry. Into Been the, on. into, uh, I've, I know I'm harvested around a hundred bears. Okay. Clients. Right. And, you know, a what lot do you of my think clients don't get bears because I'm not a very good, I'm not a very good guide. Got it. Yeah. 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 So very low success rate. Got it. Okay. But, um, no, you know, success rate, when people talk about that and it sounds like, you know, an excuse but when you get like guys who are my our success rate sometimes gets skewed because we have a lot of guys that are coming with bows yeah that have been with us multiple times that are only looking for a very very specific bear. like they they're want going home like empty-handed yeah. without if they don't find that type of bear they're going home like, wow and like i want a big shoot. board that's this size only yeah well and the Above, thing is we're very what? we're very picky with the bears we take we just don't shoot young bears like we right. want old mature boars okay and um, we like to have a nine foot and above. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's like our criteria. We like to be in the nine foot class and above. But there's plenty of guys who just, you know, I mean, everyone wants to try to get a bear. We want to get everyone a bear. But there's guys who are passing on bears because they know that, like, hey, I'll just come back and, right. and, you know, if we don't see the right bear, you know, instead of just, okay, I guess it's the last day. Let's just shoot one. You know, we're, we don't like doing that unless we're finding the right, 
right bear. You know, it would be easily 100% if we just want to shoot bears. We have plenty of bears. That's just not. But we explain to people before they come, they know that's what they're coming into. Right. We're not just going to shoot any bear. Um, so we're looking for the old mature bear. You know, we've taken lots of bears in the 20-year range, 15 to 20-year class. Um, and, you know, our goal is to get above nine, but a lot of bears in that nine and a half to 10 foot range. And that is measured from where to where? It's a, it's like a squared measurement. Okay. So from tip of the claw to tip of the claw on the front, okay. front pads, and then tip of nose to the tip of the tail and add those two together, divide by two. Okay. So it's like an average. Yep. That makes yeah. sense. Yep. So because how do you, and how people do you tell by looking? Them. That's the thing. How people, do you tell by looking at a bear that's, Plus 10, is it just repetition? Yeah, you got to really look at them. And, and, you know, guys will, I mean, I've been doing it a long time, but I still don't just like throwing out quick numbers. People are like, oh, yeah, that, that's this size of bear. You know, like I, there's, there's a whole list of, of things that you're going down your checklist. You know, when you see a true monster, it's a no-brainer. Right. It's a no-brainer. Um, but, you know, you're going through a checklist. Uh, you're looking at... <laughs> You know, like some people use head lengths. Let's say you can take like a head length. And if the head, if you can stick that head length behind the head and it falls with it, like before the hump, you know, that tells me, okay, he's, he's, if that size or that length of head falls from the back of the head to the front of the hump, that's about like a nine foot type of bear. Got it. And, and then, so then you get to a point where, okay, you just know he's huge. It doesn't matter. Right. You know, and some people will use head lengths. Okay. He's five or six head lengths long, four head lengths tall you know all that type of stuff um but it's also the demeanor and how they're walking and the just their body structure i mean there's so many things Uh, when they get older like on kodiak their their claws will become more ivory looking um you know uh, they get way more filled out and then then they start like their bodies when they move it almost looks like they're changing direction like they're articulating their body it's so much of an effort for them to move it looks like they're going to go left, and they're going to go right, and they're going to go left, and they're going to go right when they're walking. That big, like, like, sway. Yeah, big swagger to them. And and they get a really, you know, sure, their hump looks big, but then they also start getting a really swoped back, kind of like an old horse. You know, right. you sure, look yeah. at an old horse yeah. in the field, yeah. you're like, man, that looks like an old horse. And they also have, like, a really long neck to them. Obviously, when I was saying the head length, it starts showing how long the, uh, the neck is. And on a truly big bear, it dwarfs their head. Okay, oh. some people will say, man, his head looks huge. Well, that tells me it's probably not even that big of a bear. Right. But because a true, like a monster 10-foot bear, like a 10-and-a-half-foot bear, their head is like just poking out at the end of their neck. It's almost like a football player. You know, like, if oh, you know right. how like you their see bodies like a truly keep growing large, as they get older. monstrous person, you're just like, holy crap. You know, not a basketball player, but like right. a, a football player that's yep. just a monster of a man. They just don't even, like, you're just not used to seeing that. So when you see a truly monster bear, it's something that most people have never seen. It's rare to even have seen, like, the true monsters, even, like, on National Geographic. And they look different because they have no hair on them. You know, a lot of, right. a lot of those uh, films that you see on TV are all, like, done in the summertime. Yeah. And their hides are all worn off of them. Right. And so when you see, like, a fully hided, girthed out, like, fall bear or spring bear just came out of hibernation, his hide's, like, super long. It just looks like something you like barely any people have ever seen that before. There's not a whole lot of good photos of bears like that, you know. Well, uh, which makes sense because like I mean, I've seen a bunch of the videos of some of the hunts when we were up at your place mm-hmm. and like that looks like thick country that you're not gonna want to go into well, just, just to very, get a picture of a bear. They're very skittish. Yeah. You know, they don't <clears throat> they they don't just come out to a lot of the bear viewing areas where a lot of people are too, like in the <clears throat> summertime. But uh, well, you don't get big and they're for not, nothing, They go right? nocturnal a lot of times, yeah. you know. So we're catching them when they come out, you know. And that's the thing about the spring hunt; um, they're going to be out uh, in the rut looking for females, and then also their digestive tract had just gotten going before the rut. They're getting their digestive tract going. They're starting to feed on the on the grasses or roots that are um, the grasses that are just popping up and whatever. Um, they're getting their body going after they've been in hibernation you know, throughout the winter, but, uh, just getting that generator back going, you know? So what's, what's the biggest bear that's been taken up there? Brown bear wise, like what's the world record as far as size? Um, well, Is it, for, was it shot there or where, where was it? Yes. shot? Do you know? Well, it, you know, rifle, I believe was shot on Kodiak back in the, I, I can't remember when right. the world record was killed. Uh, 
but the archery one was killed in 2018 that I just so happened to have been a part of the hunt. Were you the guide on that hunt? So you were the guide on the world record archery brown bear size. This is correct. Okay. And so like my friend Chris Kamak shot that bear. And it's Shout out Chris. gigantic looking. Yeah. So How that bear, big was it? Well, body wise, it was right at around 10 and a half feet. Okay. Okay. And the skull was 29 and I think it dried 29 and four sixteenths. So we beat the old record by one sixteenth of an inch. And they measure those the same way as you do, like it's a squared, right? And, uh, Me- you, you, it's you like do, a plus and a plus, right? Uh, yeah, it's yeah. the length and the width of the skull. You just use calipers. To get got it. Degree. Right. Yeah, but we typically just use calipers to, to measure them. But yeah, uh, for Pope and Young, that was a world record for our tree bear, though. Wow. How, pretty, how far away was that bear when you shot, shot it? He shot that bear at 14 yards. 14 <laughs> yeah. yards. Okay. So you, you got to unpack that for us. You got to tell that that story because that's well, a world record story. You got to tell it. Yeah, it actually honestly was truly uh, one of the coolest stocks that I've ever done. It was a pretty shitty day. It was raining and, and windy. We were sitting underneath the tarp and saw this bear pop out on the hillside a couple miles away. And he you could tell he was on a trail and following a like a sow or somebody, but we couldn't see the sow. Right. And he finally found the sow down the brush. And we watched him, and this was the first day of our hunt for my buddy. We had just taken a couple of the bears with some other clients, and he stayed, and now we had eight days left of the season. So we got moved to another spot, a generic spot in our one of our areas that's brushy. It's not the best spot to hunt, I don't think. You know, it was just we were just put there. It was not pre-scouted, let's just say that. Okay? Right. Because people think that this type of thing would be pre-scouted, and we would know that. But anyways, <clears throat> here's the first day of the hunt, first afternoon. And I'm like, man, this is a big bear. And they bedded down in a spot over there, and it was a really challenging hillside with lots of brush, but there was an opening, and I knew we could get about 120 yards from them. And I thought, we'll get over there. We'll see what they do. And the worst-case scenario, if they start moving away, uh, you know, maybe I can try to call to them. Right. And so we got into place. They were still bedded. I left one of our friends or one of the other guides, Dan, on the other side of the valley so he could give us hand signals. You can't use radios or anything like that in Alaska, but you can do hand signals or put up flags or whatnot. So he was uh, across the, the valley, and uh, we watched the bear. It got up. And, of course, when I'm like, now I'm looking at it not from two miles away, I'm like, wow, Chris, this is a really big bear. <laughs> he's, he's above 10. Good work. And, you know, he's one of my buddies. And, I'm, you know, he's a taxidermist as well. And I'm, I said, man, this is, a, this is a bear of a lifetime. He's really big. And he's working up the hill. And I said, Chris, you know, I can try to call to him, but he's with the sow, and he may just push that sow off. Like a bull may push a cow off. Mm-hmm. And I said, it's, it's risky to call to him, but, I'll, I mean, I can try. He's like, I said, or he can just shoot him with a rifle you know <laughs> and chris is like i really i give give chris credit he goes i really really want to get one with a bow on this trip and i said okay no problem and so i said well let's let's try to call to him so bear got out to about 200 yards working up the hillside and all they had to do was go like probably 40 yards and they're out of view right you know so i'm sitting here like this works so i started calling to the bear and we used yeah what are you calling different types so we have like a predator call a deer call or like a doe fawn call, which there's no deer on the peninsula. This was on the Alaska Peninsula. Okay, Got this it. was not on Kodiak. Mm-hmm. There's no deer over there, so a doe fawn call wouldn't work. But the thing is, about that time of year, you're not going to call a male bear away with a predator call when he's with a female and they're rutting. Like they're heavily in rut. You know, they're not going to be hungry at that point. You know, they're they're, they're worried about mating. So yeah, it's showtime, what I, baby. What I've what I've observed throughout the years is bears getting aggressive with other bears. And watching them, and I've seen them on the river, and bears will walk up a river, and a bear will like stand up out of a brush pile and like look at the other bear and be like, woo, woo, and they'll just huff at them. And the bear will, and they start popping their jaws and making these sound, sounds. Yep. And so, like, I started just watching this and started kind of like trying these calls out on bears just to see if it would work. And it's been, it's like, it's like any animal you're calling to you got to know the right call in the right circumstance right otherwise you could really screw it up Mm -hmm. right and uh so it's not just a one call fits all right just like on elk hunting or something so what you have to do is get pretty aggressive with this bear like to challenge him so i had some brush behind me and i started breaking the brush 
and just started calling out to him, just kind of like a, and, you know, he kind of looks back at me, and we've got it all on film, so I'll have to get you a couple of those. But uh, he, he looks back, and he just sits down, and uh, I'm like, man, you know, I'm just thinking like, shit, man, I hope he doesn't take her off, you know, and started huffing and puffing to him and breaking more branches, and, and he finally got up and just looked at us, and he took two steps down the hill. I'm like, holy shit, he's going to come. He's like, you think so? I'm like, yep, he's going to come. And that son of a bitch came tromping down the mountain. Fast, would, like medium, nope, like how? Just going slow. He wants just to going try to slow. intimidate. Gotcha. Yep, because he, obviously I'm calling to him so he knows that he, that uh, I can see him. Right. right. So he's just coming down the hill, kind of stomping down, and he would go over top of alders and kind of smash bushes, and he would stand up and rub on bushes, and then <laughs> he disappeared at about 45 yards down I'm the big man ditch. here. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is, it's, the, the scary part is, if he's not the dominant bear in the area, whoa, right? Then he's gonna be like, oh shit, There's gotcha. Another big dominant bear in here, so I better leave, right? Yeah. And so that's a risk when you're calling to him, right? But, but when, you that size, monster, so when you see a monster, when you see a monster, you know that this that's, guy's. You can, yeah. you can probably he, piss he, him off to get you, to you. Yeah, you can get yeah. him to. Hence got the reason it. why I was gotcha. doing all that. So he disappeared in a ditch. We thought he's gonna pop out at 35 yards, and he was probably. I couldn't see him at this point. But he disappeared of what I thought was about 45 or 50 yards. And I waited. I said, like, just be ready. And uh, unfortunately, I had my long lens, my 100 to 400 on. So I thought, oh, I'm going to get good footage of when he pops out at 35 yards. Well, all of a sudden, I heard a twig break off to my right down in the ditch. I was like, shift, shift. And, and I could hear him coming up the hill. And uh, so he came. I told Chris, draw your bow, draw your bow. And he popped up at 14 yards off to the side of us. And, and he just was locked on us. He knew exactly where we were. Luckily, we had the perfect wind where right. he, had, he was trying to circle around us to get our wind. Yep. And he popped up and just stared at us at 14 yards. And Chris drilled him in the chest uh, with a 650 grain uh, grizzly stick and just hit him right in the chest. And the arrow went in about, you know, all the way to the, to the, to just past the fletchings, I could see just the orange like, right. crest on his on his uh, or the wrap on the arrow, and he wheeled around and, and took off barreling down the um, the uh, hillside, and we gave him about like thirty minutes or so, but it was getting late. It was like by this time it's probably like ten o'clock at night. It gets dark at eleven, and it was raining, and so I'm like, well, you know, there's not much blood anyways on these big bears because the fat clogs up the hole, and so. You know, a lot of guys want to leave them overnight. I don't like leaving bears overnight. Honestly, I've never found one the next day. Really? If you've, yeah. Because, yeah. like, they'll go quite a ways. And right. You need that blood trail. And so I went over to where he shot. There was blood on the ground, a pretty good blood trail. Because that's the thing about the chest shots is, you know, the chest is facing down, right? Right. Yeah. The blood is just coming out. Gravity yeah. is coming now. And uh, so there was a pretty good blood trail. And we gave about 30 minutes because that's about how long it took Dan to come across the valley to meet us. And I said, guys, we got to go in and find this bear, you know. And Dan, and I saw him at about 150 yards out. And, you know, Chris told me, if it was a bad shot, go ahead and shoot him. I said, no, you, you made a good shot. It's a good shot. You know, it's kind of a little bum that he went 150 yards because right. typically they'll only go 50 to 100 yards. Mm -hmm. So it was a very brushy hillside. So I took the lead. We went in there, and it was pretty thick, really thick, and following a pretty good blood trail. So I knew he was hit really, really good. And about, I'd say, 30 minutes later, it was getting pretty, pretty, pretty close to dark. I pop up out of a little ravine, and they were behind me about 10 yards, and there he is laying there, and he's still very much alive, huffing. And so I backed up, told Chris to knock an arrow, and he's like, do you see him? I said, yeah, he's right here. He's still alive. Get ready for another shot. He's like, how far? And I said, he's 10 yards. He's like, holy shit. You know, so he's pretty <laughs> riled up. And uh, so I moved Chris into position. The bear didn't know we were there. And uh, he got a, a good broadside shot into him. And the bear jumped up. And there was a lot of alders in between us. And that bear started wheeling around, just going crazy. He was like a bulldozer, just, just ripping alders out of the ground with his teeth, grabbing them and pulling them out, just pissed Jesus. off. Jesus. And I had him shoot him one more time, you know, because he, he was just, like, just trying to pinpoint. Trying to figure coming. out yeah. where the fuck it's yep. coming from. So I, had, I said, shoot him again, you know, and he shot him, another arrow in him. And, like, the bear was going to die. Right. You know, from the first shot. But it's like, 
you don't risk that. It's you, you put another shot into him until keep shooting until he's well, dead. What'd you yeah. tell me? Can't be too dead. Yeah, no such thing as too dead, right? So, and and I you know I knew he was a big bear. The last thing I wanted was to have to be shot with a rifle, right? You know what I mean. And so, uh, but anyways, so we got the bear killed, and uh, the sow had come over to check us out. We ran her off once. And now, but, you know, we take pictures by this time. It's dark. Right. Okay. Well, at about 2.30 in the morning, we're almost done skinning. Okay. Right. Pitch dark. And we hear a limb pop right behind me. And those guys pull up with their headlamps and they're like, bear, bear, bear. And that sow was four yards behind me in closing, coming through because I'd cut a bunch Holy of brush out. Holy shit. And had thrown it behind She's me. coming for a boyfriend. She was, yep. She knew that she could smell him in there. Right. And, uh, so she was coming up behind us because it had been raining, so everything's soft, so you couldn't hear anything, and like couldn't hear leaves or anything crack on the ground. And uh, anyways, so they yell, and I had to. The rifles were, you know, up against some brush over there, so I jump over, they hand me my rifle, I swing around to shoot her. Well, she had stopped and was on the other side of the carcass and was just backing off, and we yelling, and so right. she backed out of there because we didn't want to have to shoot her. Right? Yeah. And so she backed out of there and took off, but then we could hear. She did like a 50 yard radius around us, just popping and bra- breaking branches and whatnot. But uh, it was, it was a little bit, uh, old Chris was a little bit wound up. He's like, God dang it. Okay, enough, enough. This is enough. Let's just get the hell out of here. <laughs> we finished skinning and uh, loaded up and we got back to camp at like 6 30 in the morning, you know. But it was, uh, it was probably one of the coolest experiences, you know, uh, to see that big bear. And I mean, it'd have been super cool to go and just stock up on him and get it done. But to be able to like call him off of a sow, right? And it was kind of like he just looked at her and said, "Wait here, yeah, I'll deal with this." Yeah. And she just kind of sat up there on the hill, you know, two hundred yards, right. watching the whole time, you know. And and then when he ran off, that's when she tried to come down and and find him. But uh, yeah, it was it was pretty badass. So and Chris did a really good job of you know holding it together, getting the shots off, and 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 the coolest thing is we had no clue for probably. You know, we got back to Kodiak. We flew back over to Kodiak from the peninsula, and we hung out for a few days, flushing a bear hide. I think it was three days later I finally measured the bear skull. We just knew we had a great bear. Right. Number one, you're with I, Chris is literally one of my best friends. Right. So to, to have an awesome hunt with your friends to experience something like that is so cool. And he's mounted a lot of my bears before for my clients. So for him to actually be on a monster – and to just see, and number one, get to see what I do, right? Right. Is my job. And, uh, but to experience that with your friend. And then I remember going over, like, oh, I should go measure that skull. It was a pretty good sized skull. So I go over and like measure it. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. So I call over another guide friend of mine and I said, measure that. You know, I didn't say anything to him. Right. He measured it and he's like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> we all measured it whoa. again three, four times. And Chris is over, like, what? It's like, uh, right now you're, uh, Currently larger than the world record. <laughs> so, and it, you know, it wasn't like, you know, so it was just icing, you know, on what, the cake. What happens, like, who's the certifying authority on that, right? Well, Pope and Young since official, like, it has to dry, like yep. a 60-day drying period. And then we had a Pope and Young score come. They scored it for Pope and Young and Boone and Crockett. And once they found out that it's a potential world record, then there's a special panel that is put together, and they flew out. To oh, measure. shit. Oh, yeah. They flew yeah. out on their own dime okay. to measure bear skull. Because it doesn't happen all the time. Right. No, no. This is, like, really rare. And so they put together a special panel, flew out, and uh, measured the skull. And they said, okay, it's currently sitting at world record. We need to go back and, you know, we'll review this and uh, the paperwork and everything. And, and we'll be calling you shortly. And Chris called me a couple days later. He's like, yep, it's official. So we beat it by 1 16th. I mean, like I said... I'm not like, I'm not really in the business as like a, like a trophy guide, like just strictly look, wanting to kill trophies, you know, type of things. Like we want to take people on adventures, kill old mature animals type of thing. That, that's what we're really after. So to actually be able to accomplish that was like icing on the cake. Right. Especially like with your friend. You yeah. Know, it's, it's pretty cool. But, you know, with that, everyone, you know, you get a lot of guys calling, hey, do uh, you think we could like maybe break that again? And it's like, dude, that, who knows? I mean, right. honestly, it is pretty crazy because like several years back, I'd say 10 years ago, I had a guy with the recurve that 
shot a bear of the exact same size and he hit it bad and I had to hand him the rifle for him to shoot it and it was it would have been the world record with a recurve time, wow. with the recurve that was on Kodiak so we almost had it at one point like 10 years right. earlier on yeah. Kodiak but you know I say I say it's a, like a really rare thing but I mean we we are pretty blessed I mean once a we, decade we, is yeah, still pretty rare we, we do have huge uh, bears five of the top 10 Pope and Young bears have come mm-hmm. from our our areas so and I've got it What's the difference between the uh, rifle and bow as far as size? Uh, the rifle world record, I think, is, I want to say, 30 and 15 sixteenths on a skull. And, and I could be wrong, but I think okay. it's 30 and 15 sixteenths, and the bow is 29 and five, or 4 sixteenths. Got it. So, I mean, there's a... An inch and a half-ish. Yeah. yeah. But that's that's a lot in the in It's the a lot, world, yeah. Right. Know, yeah. Not like elk where, you know, you can beat it by... 20 inches or 15 inch or 10 and whatever. Yeah. But, uh, you know, so it, the cool thing about that to me is it shows that we are still getting these types of animals. Right. Yep. Okay. It's not like, oh, back in the day, there used to right. be some real big boys. Like, no, we are still taking, outfitters are still taking very old, mature. They're, they're doing the right thing. Yes. Like they're allowing yeah. the bears to get big. Like the yeah. people that are guiding and outfitting yeah. are doing the yeah. right thing for the right. animals it, it, on the island. Yeah. And that's the thing about Pope and Young or Boone and Crockett. A lot of people look, look at them as like just trophy, you know, record keepings. Yeah. But it's also, it's cool because you can look back to see like, okay, is there animals that used to be maybe way bigger back in the day, you know, and that you can see some that are still up way way up there in that in that category that are like very yeah. large animals so it shows that the biologists are, are doing a good job or like state of alaska or whatever state right is still doing a really good job managing animals you know and on top of that we, we've got to talk about like the the times where you've been ready to shit your pants you're so fucking scared because you, there has to have been a few of these circumstances or one where maybe you're, I'm sure that you're, sow gave maybe you a little, a little bit, bit of, of pee pee stunk out in your pants. You know, honestly, and I or you just got ice. You just got ice in your veins. Bears to me, yeah. When I the first time I got really close to a bear, after that I was like, wow, that was the coolest thing. Right now I'm talking about like prepared with a firearm. Right? Yeah, prepared for the situation. Right, it's. Not cool if when you don't have a gun, right? And there, and you're like, oh shit, well, you're out hiking and one pops right. up right in front of you. That's not cool, right? Um, but when you're on a hunt, like I've always felt pretty because most of the time, when, when a bear's coming in close on on a bow hunt, like right. we're stalking or, or we're calling him in or we're stalking up close to him, I'm looking through my scope, right? And I, I more so get fired up when i don't know where they're at i'm like got it where is he is he coming in where is he at and then also when i see him it's kind of like you calm down hold together keep the hunter under control because the hunter's gonna be watching you if you get out of control they're gonna get out of control right they feed off of you and if you're calm cool collected then they're calm cool collected um i've only had like a couple situations where uh the closest call i ever had was a bear charged me on a mountain goat hunt by myself and a sow charged me, and I was up at the top of a mountain, you know, 2,500 feet up in the You're like, uh, where the shit the did you Alpine. come from? And she just popped up, and I yelled at her at like 25 yards. She comes sprinting over the hill, and when she ran at me, it was just like, oh, shit. She's got, like, no emotion. I pulled up my 375. I, for some reason, brought my 375 on a goat hunt. Right. You know, typically would have brought my 7 mag, but the last second, yep. I was like, oh, I'm going by myself. You know, I'm just going to take my 375. Whatever. Yeah. And she came barreling over the ridge, and I shot a round off at her feet. And as when the recoil is going back, I remember like just kind of seeing her. And as I reloaded in, it was just kind of like she is not stopping. There is no emotion. I blew rocks all over her face. You're like, Nothing. I have, you're like, there I was have to zero shoot this emotion. Bear. And as soon as I closed the bolt, boom, you know, so it was like kind of like a boom, boom. And I still to this day have never worked the bolt as that, that fast. I've right. the range because <laughs> I practice a lot with this full mag and shooting the 375 as fast as possible. Oh, that's right. Uh, working yep. for not, you know, for because a lot of times guys will, will um, you know, jam their guns or, or short shuck the, because the, 375's a long pole on a bolt. And <laughs> I, it's like, it's really amazing. Yeah, the good Lord above was watching over me that day because 
it, number one, it's really stupid to fire a warning shot that close. Don't do that. Just shoot them. If they're that close to <laughs> charging, you just shoot them. And, but I was just, I didn't want to have to shoot. Right. You know, she had cubs back there running behind her. Right. Big two year old cubs. Right. And the cubs, so when I hit her, I hit her right in the head. And the one thing that saved her from not running me over or saved me from, from her not running me over was her, like when she was running her head, she was really fat and her head was kind of weaving off to the side. And when I shot her, took her off to the side of the nose and she just kind of went right past me here and rolled down the mountainside and her cubs stopped, you know, for me to Trevor and were huffing and puffing at me. And so I've shot two shots and I had two, sh two shots left. Right. And there's Crap. three cubs. Right. You know, and I'm just like, oh shit, you know, I'm huffing and puffing or not huffing, but like they're huffing and puffing at me. You're I'm yelling. yelling at them. They yeah. finally back off. And they run away, but mom's down there, you know, she's dead. But, you know, and it was kind of the end of my goat hunt. I had to what call, do you, fish call fishing Yeah, game, what do you do in that game, situation? Report it. They call fishing game, uh, let them know what happened. Right. And they were super cool with me. You know, they just, number one, wanted to know if I was okay. Right. You know, do, we, do you want to send a, or do you want to send a trooper out? We can help you. I'm like, no, I'll, I'll just skin it. I'm like, I'm way up here, dude. Like, I don't. Leave me out. Leave me here. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll just, I'll skin it out and bring it down. And so it was just a bummer, you know, cause like we take pride of being able yeah. to de-escalate a situation right on bears you know but and she wanted you just, dead yeah it was yep. a bad year it was yeah. bad fish bad berries it was low water level I mean, like everything was bad that year and she was just hungry and come to find out from fish and game when i went there and turned it in they said this is probably the south it's been uh, harassing other goat hunters up there there was this really like, it got another goat hunter's goat like apparently right. two weeks before or something of that nature and she was a real bitch apparently and so they were actually, hey, we're, we're glad that you're experienced and you can run a rifle appropriately. Right. And, and instead of someone else that, you know, got got eaten. it. Yeah. Somebody could have yeah. got eaten. Yeah. So, but, you know, um, I don't know. Like, I, I had a bear last fall I had to track. I had a guy hit one really bad. And the leaves were still on the, on the alders on the Alaska Peninsula. It was super thick. And the guy hit it bad. And I, I was like, hoping where, be, where did he hit it? Uh, I hit it back. Yeah. Hit it back. Yeah. In the, in the gut. And um, it was getting dark and it went in there into the brush. And I said, okay, well, we need to come back tomorrow. It'll, it, hopefully. Oh, when he was running off, because um, I was telling my hunters, when you shoot, if you think you hit bad or made a bad shot, tell me and just tell me to shoot. Or if they if it's if the bear's still there and it's a bad shot, I'll hand him the rifle. They can mm -hmm. finish it off on their own. Got it. And as soon as the guy shot, he knew he pulled his bow, and he he goes shoot him, shoot him. Like he knew, and I could tell I, the arrow hit way back. Right. And that bear's not going to die from that. It's going to go a long ways. So I pull up, I shoot him. Or, or he he's going down into a ditch. I shoot twice. Bam, bam, and I rolled him. Well, I must have hit him a little high because he got up and kept going, and. Uh, Anyways, we left him overnight, and I started tracking him the next morning, and I jumped him at about 10 yards in front of me. Luckily, he went the other way, but I couldn't even see in the brush. Right. And you can't just shoot in the brush because it could be another bear on the carcass. Right. No. Yeah. You always have to ID the animal, right? Right. And I ended up jumping him, I think, five more times within Shit. 10 yards. And, and, like, I got him changed directions in the brush, and I had another guy in there, and he was not having it like you can tell i mean it doesn't matter how long a guy right. can guide you're either comfortable close in the brush with bears or you're not most just rifle bear guides are not comfortable being in close with bears because they never get that they don't, they don't have to close. get that close if you're a bow hunting guide you're most of the time in that close and still a lot of them are not very comfortable you know i've just had a lot of situations that have gone bad people pissed off at me because i've shot bears this and that and the other but they're not the one having to make the split second decision right so i try with everything possible to not make that bad decision right unless yeah. it's 100 percent needed and there was something that told me like the last time i jumped the bear in the brush uh i said you know he's obviously not hit as bad as what i thought my 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 shots must have hit high and just got you know a little bit of muscle and fat or something and he's probably sore but i don't know if he you know right he's, he's just lived, pissed like i just had to stop because I, I just felt like i'm really pressuring this bear he's gone the other way all these times but now i feel like he's gonna turn and right and it was so thick that i'm like this isn't this isn't smart like i have health insurance i think but it's <laughs> you know well two of my buddies have been mauled in the past couple of years really yeah one of my guide buddies a bear got him after a client uh 
uh, made a bad hit on him. He went in the brush, and he just screwed up. He left his safety on. Bear charged, and he just pulled up and click. Oh shit! And and he went to, and Bear was on him. Oh, got him pretty good. But he, uh, you know, and he he full recovery, and he's back to guide him. But uh, um, it, it's just one of those things. You got to kind of know when to pull it, you know. And and um, but uh, yeah, I mean the client was pretty cool about it. He was like super upset at himself for making a bad call, and he apologized to me for, you know putting me in that situation but it's like dude that's just my job you know you got to do that you know you guys are in the military how many bad you know close calls and in tough situations that you've been in and you're always going to go into something you know you just have to go off your training and you know like i'm a huge proponent of like hearing protection like if i'm doing any sort of like projects around the house or like right. around guns or whatever i'm always wearing hearing protection because when i'm in the brush with the bear and he's wounded in there, like, you have to be able to hear. Right. And, like, I want to hear every little thing. And, like, because I've heard, like, twigs, like, break or something move, or, like, you can hear them, like, scrape the ground a little bit when, when they're moving, and it's just like, okay, he's right here. And, like, you don't see him, but you know they're close. And so I've, I've been very fortunate and lucky to have heard the bears multiple times before right. they start to move. And a lot of guys think it's like, oh, I don't need hearing protection. It's like, Dude, I want my ears to be good because, like, they've saved my ass several times, you yeah. know, um, when you when you get in the brush looking for bears like that. And uh, it's just – well, hunting in general, you got to have – I think it's good to have good hearing. Unfortunately, probably for you guys, you guys around enough gunfire in your life. That- yeah, we don't have that. I, I mean, I think it's, I think some of us are all right, you know, but I think a lot of us are a little bit deaf. Yeah. But y- you just huh? – I- yeah. <laughs> What? Yeah. What? But uh, I, I think uh, just like with any training, you know, and a lot of times when people get mauled, it's yeah, the firearms are like they, they screw up, you know. And I mean, my, my thing is like, hey, if I get mauled one of these days, I probably deserve it. I mean, I've killed a lot of bears. Like they, right. I mean, they might have I your would, number. Like there might be like yeah, a I mean, wanted, like, I'm not gonna be mad, like a wanted right? poster I mean, around the island. Yeah, no kidding. Written in bear. Yeah, I mean, I sure hope it. Like, <laughs> sure hope it doesn't happen. But did, did you know that guy, the grizzly man? Did you know him? No. No, but one of my pilots was the one who found him. Really? Yeah. yeah. Hey, so there was this uh, photo that was circulating on social media a little while ago. Of yeah, the guy. The guy in the snowmobile. Yeah. 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 Do you know anything about that scenario? Um, or? No, not really. I mean, I, I, my friend Ben O'Brien, you know, from the Hunting Collective podcast, he interviewed the son of him just recently. And so he did a podcast with him, and he told the whole story so he can – you could go listen to that thing, and and they could tell you about. It. But I mean, what, what's that a, podcast called? The Hunting Collective. Cool. Yeah. So is it good? Would well, you recommend it? Awesome. Okay. So good. I don't know. I'm just wondering. You know, uh, Ben is a good buddy of mine. Is he? Yeah. Yeah. Because he used to run the uh, hunting uh, category for Yeti. Got it. Ben and I have been on many hunts. I put yeah. his life in danger a few times <laughs> <laughs> in Nepal and in Kodiak, and yeah. So we've had some really good times and. But uh, no, I think he did a really good job interviewing him, and they tell a good story. They, yeah, they, like the the son explains that, and but on that one was firearm really malfunction. Well, fire. Well, just just uh, not as proficient as maybe they should have yeah, been. Yeah, there was some. There were some. You know, I mean, I'm not like faulting him. Things happen, like you know. Well, especially uh, but, in the split seconds of being yeah. charged by a grizzly. Yeah, no, it, it, there was there. some apparently, and like I say, I, I don't want to speak for him, but there was some uh, malfunctions of the ammo. Um, he used because he used some reloads instead of the factory. Wow. And then uh, I think the son said when he went to shoot the bear, when he came out of the hole, uh, and he had one in the chamber. This is what I heard. It, and instead of just shooting, he racked and racked yeah. another one in. Yep. I've seen that happen many times. Like yep. People act like, oh, why do you do that? I, I've seen it. I've seen guys like lever actions. Mm-hmm. So there's already one in there, or a shotgun especially. How many times oh, yeah. you see yeah. people like, they're climbing and they, and they – and they, they freaking reloaded another shell in there. It's like, why did you shoot that? Or why did you kick that one out? But it happens. Mm-hmm. Like, your mind is not, you know what I mean? It's yeah. Like, you're, like, constantly practicing, you know? Well, even uh, if you practice and you're not practicing in the, in the correct way, then you're building yeah. bad muscle memory. And ultimately, that, that's what your body's going to revert to in a time of stress. Right. I've seen it happen a lot. Hundreds of times where you look at somebody in a, you know, stressful incident, especially in the training where you've tried to right. replicate something and like, Oh, that's fucking your problem, dude. Like, yeah. what do you get? Why, why are you doing that? Like, why are you, why are you doing that? Most it's crazy. people have never 
their lives have never been in that situation yeah. of like having to react and react right now. And obviously, like, when you think in the military, yes, you guys train for this all the time. The interesting thing, like, when you take people hunting, and especially if it's for dangerous game, it's, it's, it's kind of like, could you imagine taking, like, hey, man, I'm going to take you, and we're going to go do a raid, and yeah. you just paid me to go, and you're going to put their life into, it's obviously not the same, but could you imagine if they did? I thought that'd but be it, pretty it's cool. It's a super interesting scenario, though, if you're like, hey, dude. Here's your rifle. You're yeah. going to go in number one. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that. I'm like, that'd be so cool. Like, You're number one, man, on this one. I hope you got it. You paid a lot of money here. <laughs> yeah. Don't I worry. Hope you're going to get what you want. We knocked on the door so they know we're yeah. here. Hey, man, <laughs> hey, dude, you wounded him. Yeah. We're going to need to go in and find him. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully, he, hopefully. I think he's out. I don't know not if he's sure. wearing a suicide vest or not. I hope he's not. For your for your case, I hope he's not. Get in there, Tiger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. You know, most of the time, like with, 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 with bears, you know, it, it, it 99% of the time it go it, it happens, you know, just the way it should go. But I try to get guys prepared. Okay, as soon as you shoot, rack another shell on and shoot again. Don't just stare and think you're going to have a one-shot kill, you know, because like with rifles, I say there's no such thing as a one-shot kill. You so know. there's, so you've never seen a marine sniper right. shoot a brown bear because they're one shot one kill. Ask Logan. That's <laughs> right. That's his nickname. One shot one kill. Hot Ready Logi. to die. Yeah. <laughs> never will. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I asked that question at the beginning, though, is because it's like you're you're having to go out with strangers in the highest stress scenarios, and you know you, you haven't been able to work with them. Like when you do raids with with a group of guys Your team. night after yeah. night after night after night. You like, know those you, dummies. You know how they yeah. operate, but you're bringing up guys you barely know yeah. to pursue well, this ultra-dangerous activity. So what I what I learned throughout the years, man, it's so good to have this siren in the background. It is really yeah. nice. Yeah, I wonder yeah. what happened. Yeah. Hey, know, we're at Total a, Archery Challenge, and we're yeah. outside. That's why yeah, you that's may right. be Total hearing. Total Archery Challenge, we're outside, and there's a uh, an ambulance showing up. I mean, I... I'm just envisioning it. You know a, why? A bow. We're killing this podcast. A bow yeah, problem. we're killing this podcast. <laughs> we're destroying Dad this podcast. jokes for days, baby. Yeah, that's a fucking amazing joke. <laughs> uh, but no, so this is what I learned is it was at the beginning of my guide career when things would go bad, guy made a bad shot, you know, wounded something or, or whatever. I'd always like, man, that hunter sucked. You know, he was he, he messed up. It was always their fault, right? And yeah. I started realizing like, no, at the end of the at the end of the hunt, we either got something or we didn't, and no one cares. You either got or you you were successful, or you weren't. Right? Yeah, it's a winner or and loss. And these excuses, okay. And I learned way early on that like I have to like understand that if if unless I start telling people and preparing them, like when we're on the hill, like we're talking about it a lot, scenarios and how things are going to go down. Yeah. When we get up there, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And I learned my lesson several times with guys that I'm like, this guy's experienced. He'll know what to do. We get up there, they shoot. And it's like, dude, reload. And they're like, no, I got him. You're like, no, no, reload, reload. And I, yeah. I remember losing a bear with a 76 year old man who never went on like a heavy duty hunt after that again. Cause it was a rough hunt on him and he lost his bear. And the guy was so, he had so much pride and his shooting capabilities, and he wounded the bear, and he had told me beforehand, I don't want any of you shooting my bear. This is my bear. There will be no follow-up shots. You understand? And he, like, scared the shit out of me. So I'm like, dude, you know? And so anyways, I learned, and uh, we'll, 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 this was before I really knew anything about Jocko, right? And, and like, taking ownership, right? But, like, it was just kind of one of these things, you know, uh, when uh, I was like, dude, if I don't tell these people, like, it's, I can't trust that they're going to to do it right. You know, so what I started doing is telling people like, hey, no offense. I'm just going to tell you straight up right now. You probably know everything I'm going to tell you, but things get forgotten. So we need to go over the steps, okay? And I'll tell you multiple times, like as we are approaching, like, hey, make sure your pin, your, you know, your sight's on, you know, make sure this, make sure that, hey, watch this, hey, watch that, you know? And, and we're constantly going over things. Yeah. Like big time with, with rifles, one of the big things is guys having their scopes turned up, you know, and they'll have it turned up because they're looking at an yeah. animal previous and they they're on right. 10 power up. It's like, dude, back it all the way down, you know, or right. put your sight back down or, or whatever. So uh, I started taking more of the initiative of like taking full ownership in that, knowing that like, dude, if I, it sucks for me, even though it may have been totally their fault, it just sucks for our company and for them too. If, if, uh, 
if it's something that I could have reminded them. Early. Yeah, you so, you really have to adopt that no implied task yeah. mentality. Yeah. Like yeah. especially in those high stress scenarios and new environments for people, like it's the the margin for error is so small like I would have to imagine you have to embrace that. Like every little detail of every little scenario yep. that could happen has to be locked in. Yep. Cause it's a, it's a life or death scenario or like, you know, a 76 year old guy, like probably one of his last hunts. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to die with a bunch of regret or like yeah, sure. one of the last things yeah. I did is just a big regret of mine. Yep. Yeah. That, that guy was a real jerk and he still is a real jerk. I've tried to talk to him after that and like try to, you know, but I more so would just feel bad for him. I'm just like, right. man, I know he's living with that right now. And I'm just like, dang it, man, I wish I could have done a better job. But, uh, you know, that's just the whole thing. You just got to, you know, in any of any of the, you know, of, of your work that you do, you know, when you're trying to explain <laughs> stuff to people, just trying to do it the right manner sure. where everyone understands your yeah. job, right? And to where they're going to do a good job when you're trying to teach people. And that is part of, the, of guiding and understanding yeah. Um, how to talk to people. And that's been a big yeah. learning curve for me and like dealing with, you know, we haven't spent a lot of time out there together, but like me dealing like Will, my cousin, yeah. you know, and he's he's been guiding me for three years, you know, and just learning the appropriate ways to deal with employees you know, and not treating yeah. them like employees. Right well, as well as clients say if yeah. they do miss and you're trying to get them onto the animal again. Yeah. You know? Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. And that's like, the whole thing. Like, like our experience last year, like you did everything right and got him the animal eventually. Yeah, we had a guy break his sight off his bow right before the shot. Yeah. And he had missed three times earlier. He had. But, uh, <laughs> earlier the day. But he yeah. broke his sight off his bow, and he's like, oh. And I was like, oh. <laughs> How did he break the sight off his bow? I Just think like, what he did was he had it strapped on his pack, and he probably, like, either slipped well, or oh, he fell down. You, or, 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 I mean, or he set his pack down. You or spotted something. the goat, and then it was him right behind you and me behind him. You said... You know, we like kind of low crawled up to that ridge, mm -hmm. and you're like, wait, wait, wait. He turned over, and I think that's when he oh, broke the sight okay. on the bow. I think. I mean, that's my best guess for what happened because you know, he grabs it to draw, and he's like, uh oh. So maybe and it's the your sight's fault. bangling. Like you should have been there to like pat yeah. his. Yeah, like for sure. Like, oh, that, or that, yeah, must like, have you been have it. to be right behind the right people, there, Trevor. Right there. Like you have Catching to be them. like coddling the butt cheeks at times. I was about there. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're learning, and you're going to get this down. Yeah. You know? Well, and there, if there's one It'll thing happen. I know about Cole is he, he's a, he's, he's, he's very stiff, stiff, you know, <laughs> no sense of humor. It's true. You know, I no. can't imagine being stuck in the field with you for an extended period of time. Yeah. You be, know, the pyramid tent together, three feet apart was, yeah. it was just miserable. Well, that's just the way it is. I mean, I can't wait to have you guys in camp. It's going to be amazing. Be. I know. I can't, I can't amaze. I, I can't imagine how fun it's going to be because Matt and I are actually going up to go on a hunt with with you spring. It's gonna be next fun next year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully Matt doesn't like tear another bicep or something. <sighs> He's only got one more, so I know, I know. I mean, but every time there's like tack, you know, he hurts himself. So I'm just hoping that he doesn't hurt himself before. I just wish he was. Like this. I mean, he's obviously not very tough looking at all. No. Um, no. He doesn't look healthy. Yeah, he, he needs to have a better diet. Yeah, I think so. I think he needs to. I think he needs to eat more vegetables. Maybe I don't know. Vitamins don't know. of some sort. Maybe possibly. Some vitamin. Yeah. Maybe he needs to put some vitamin S in his diet. Maybe that I, think, I suggest he does whatever Jared's doing. I mean, Jared seems healthy. Jared is is healthier than a horse. He'll probably actually outlive all of us. <laughs> Because and, so and he's gonna just laugh his way into the grave. Like <laughs> Trevor's running a thousand miles a week and yeah. intermittent fasting for twelve days at a time. And and Jared will outlive me by twenty Jared's years. Jared's like <laughs> sleeping forty five minutes, like drinking paint thinner. Sometimes he doesn't understand the difference, and he's gonna be like, "I live till ninety six. I don't know what the deal is, guys. <laughs> what are you guys doing? What's your trick, man? <laughs> ah, I just drink paint thinner. Yeah, I've just been, you know, I've just been doing whatever I want to do on my my life. Well, Cole, thanks a lot, man. No, I appreciate, appreciate you guys. It. Yeah, yeah where can uh, where can everybody yeah. find you? Where are you? Uh... Well, I try to be pretty hidden. Yeah. You know, I don't really like to advertise too much. I'd like to give you a shout out for making me some advertising shirts, Evan. Thank well, you. Well, this is how good at marketing he is. <laughs> I was like, hey, dude, I, I, I want some shirts I can wear them at TAC for your company and maybe wear them on FRA because uh, I, you know, I like, I follow him on social media. I like, 
uh, you know, I genuinely like what you're doing. And he's like, yeah, I don't really have any, but, uh, I was out of them. Yeah, I was out. It's like, well, how long have you been out? He's like, I, I don't know. I just sell I <laughs> years, <been> out. <laughs> forever. It's like, well, that's fine. I'll just make some, and then we'll have them for the show, uh, and and or for other events because we're going to Utah after this, the tack down there, uh, and so Kramer Kodiak Guide Service. Look at that thing. It's you know, beautiful. you know, that is a, such a good looking shirt on the back of it. If he gets up and turns around. Would you like me to show it? I would yes, love for people to show it because it's a Black Rifle Coffee co-branded shirt because he's got BRCC. Yep. And what's that say? The coffee will continue until your attitude improves. Yes, the coffee will continue until your attitude improves. So I would highly suggest if you've seen that shirt, you should go buy it. Yeah, they're they're 30,000. <laughs> and we'll give you a bear hunt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Free bear hunt with a shirt. Free bear hunt. That's yeah. freaking cool. That. That's kind of how that works. <laughs> and you know, we'll maybe even toss in a Yeti cup or something. Oh, you don't sell those. You have to go on a hunt to get one of those? Yeah. yeah. Never mind then. Uh well, you know what? I'll tell you. <laughs> you know, what we should do is we should do a a next year. If people, if we get enough feedback and comments on this episode, I'll tell you what. We'll do a drawing for a bear guided bear trip with whole creamer. <laughs> and <laughs> you might just be able to get one of those shirts That's because right. I think that would be a fucking epic experience for yeah, somebody. Would. Yeah, would. A black rifle, you have to be a black rifle coffee subscriber. So that'll be the some of the hinge pin to this. I but I think it would be Heck yeah. Let's get some positive feedback, maybe some comments. Tell me what you guys think, because I, I think it would be incredible to get a, a Black Rifle Coffee customer a bear hunt up there yeah. for you guys. Yeah, it'd be a pretty awesome it'd adventure. Be, it'd be really cool. Yep. Yeah, no, thank you for the shirts, Evan. I really appreciate it. It's really nice of you. Whatever. I'm a dick. <laughs> Just try to be nice. <laughs> All right. Yep. It's been Free Range American. Thanks a lot, guys.